Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include Airlines should have onboard wheelchairs, EU Commission says. Romanians and Bulgarians coming to work in Britain can avoid paying tax in the UK. Poland attacks David Cameron's plan to ban Polish and EU migrants from claiming child benefit. And the European Union referendum bill clears the first hurdle. Plus, Tory MPs demand new EU veto powers for Britain. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the Unit Nightly News. The European Transport Commissioner reminds airlines that the use of onboard wheelchairs is a recommended practice. Unlike the United States, where provision of wheelchairs, also known as aisle chairs, is mandatory on board aircraft with more than 60 seats, the European Union does not have such requirements. MS sufferer John Findlay is the latest victim of indifference and unavailability of this essential onboard facility. The European Transport Commissioner reminds airlines that the use of onboard wheelchairs is a recommended practice. Unlike the United States, where provision of wheelchairs, also known as aisle chairs, is mandatory on board aircraft with more than 60 seats, the European Union does not have such requirements. MS sufferer John Findlay is the latest victim of indifference and unavailability of this essential onboard facility. Star Etheridge jumped in with some joined-up thinking on this story via our Google Plus community. Links are below if you want to get involved and join us. Star said, Not only that, but they should also help people with other disabilities to arrange booking, embarking and disembarking. I have friends who, due to having a number of strokes and brain injuries, and other friends who are blind, are unable to deal with printed words. They just require a designated person whom they can contact at the airline by phone to book travel and arrange all the necessary assistance. It's not a major ask or requirement, but would make life much easier and less stressful for those passengers. Is it too much to ask that this is also a requirement? Disabled people want to get out and about too. They may need a carer, but a few small adjustments can give them a little control and independence. How about ensuring that the CAA states all airlines should have this facility? It would give so many that little bit of independence to give them confidence in other areas of life. Well, this sounds like a good plan. What a shame that the airlines don't think in this way and implement it as a service feature extension. Great customer service equals great marketing and great marketing equals better business. Great point. Well put, Star Etheridge. Now, Star went on to say... I hope someone from an airline or the Civil Aviation Authority will see this and contact me to discuss what they could do to help passengers with disabilities. It would be a business advantage and show fantastic customer care. So, if you're in the airline business and you want to make a positive change that would improve your business proposition across the board, then get in touch with Star via her website, staretheridge.co.uk. And links to the full story are on our website below. EU rules allow migrants posted to Britain for less than two years to pay national insurance and, in certain cases, income tax in their own country. The basic tax rates are at a much lower rate at the migrants' home countries, and almost 100,000 EU immigrants are already in the UK, benefiting from the regulations. In Bulgaria, the flat rate on tax is 10%, and in Romania, 16% of earnings compared to the basic UK rate of 20% tax and 12% national insurance. EU migrants working in the UK but paying tax elsewhere are still entitled to some free health care, along with housing and child benefits. Now, it's easy to take a protectionist point of view here, which immediately leads to a default position of blaming the individuals, but sociologists would see that the situation is vastly more complex. Think for a moment what is the most likely section of the communities in Romania and Bulgaria to pack up and ship out. Well, almost without exception, the greatest majority are those with capabilities and skills, either migrating as a family to find work as a unit, 
as an individual family member looking to support a family back home, or the young single people with skills who wish to find a better life. Now, I don't watch very much television, but last night I happened to watch a documentary, Benefit Street. In last night's episode, it tracked the plight of a group of 14 Romanian men, average ages of around 30, brought to the UK on a lorry with the promise of regular but low-paid work, that promise being £40 for eight hours' work. Now, what happened in reality was they were exploited and trapped. Their so-called boss took their passports as part of the contract, then worked them for 17 hours a day, paying them just £10 for that work, apparently saying he had to deduct fees to pay for their contract. Now, cases such as these, whilst still numerous, are but the fringe of the problem. The biggest problem is the destruction of cultural, stable communities. Now, I first saw this problem when I was running a company here in the South West and got to meet a lovely gentleman by the name of Hugh Scudder from a charity called Christian Response to Eastern Europe. In short, during the collapse of the Soviet Union, the small principality of Moldova met with deep and prolonged economic collapse. Now, what is happening across Europe today happened there before. However, once the central pillar of the community left, then the social fabric collapsed too. What was left in Moldova were the elderly, the sick and the children, thousands of orphaned children. No schools, and why? Because there were no teachers, no maintained buildings, and you guessed it, no builders. Our kleptocrat buffoons in their centrally heated offices in Brussels with on-site leisure facilities and yes ma'am, no ma'am, three bags full ma'am, parliamentarian assistants, think that their policies and Schengen agreements are for the greater good of the people. But they are not. Many people would crow conspiracy, but I genuinely believe it to be a wholesale cock-up. When you think for a moment, it is easy to see how the politicians would measure the wealth of a people by monetary reckoning. But family, friendships and community are not built with money. They're built from love. There is nothing wrong with adversity and no greater feeling of worth than to struggle and triumph together in the face of hardship. Look at the communities and hard-forged relationships built here in Britain, post-war, where even in the big cities, everyone knew everyone else, up and down the street. People could leave their doors unlocked. Those societies and communities were largely self-regulating. The people were welcoming. Friends, families and communities were united and strong. And together we rebuilt Britain when she was all but destroyed. So you can take either side of the argument the liberal doors wide open, eyes wide shut, or you can take the UKIP eyes wide open, doors closed shut approach to this issue. But each of those comes with its own unique set of problems. Perhaps the answer is a change of thinking. What if government stopped trying to treat people like dependent children and instead focused on enablement and empowerment? If it built upon community, social justice, independence and self-reliance, that would mean less government more power divested back to the people. The socio-economic policies of the European Union have failed. Many of the member states' economies have been destroyed. The debt burden is spiralling out of control and the kleptocrats are running up and down in the corridors of Brussels like the late hare from Alice in Wonderland with no clue what to do except chirp, recovery, I'm late, recovery, I'm late. Poland has hit back at David Cameron's call for a change to the European Union's treaties to allow the government to withdraw child welfare benefits from Polish migrants working in Britain. Radislaw Sikowski, Poland's foreign minister, has denounced the proposal as unfair because it would mean Polish taxpayers taking on the child benefit costs of Poles, paying the same level of taxes in Britain as British workers. If Britain gets our taxpayers, shouldn't it also pay their benefits? Why should Polish taxpayers subsidise British taxpayers' children? He posted on Twitter on Monday. (laughs) Well, King David of Cameroni has a very low opinion of the intellectual capacity of the British public. Just how simple-minded does he think we are? This is a blag. Well, in fact, it is, in reality, a lie. And there are two reasons. Number one, treaty change would require a unanimous vote of the European Commission to change any aspect of it, and that includes repatriation of powers back to the UK. And the second reason? His notion is illegal under EU law, 
And whilst he leads us on with the idea that the UK Parliament can selectively ignore certain EU legislation, it absolutely cannot. EU law is applicable in every member state by a mechanism known as direct effect. And Foreign and Commonwealth Office Document 30, 1048, which you can download from our 1972 et al. section on the website, and cornerstone for many of our arguments here at the unit, makes this crystal clear. The UK Parliament has been neutered as a result of our sellout politicians giving away our rights to govern ourselves. But just like the feckless Tom, they wander around Whitehall crowing and meowing, but you and me and everyone else knows they're firing blanks. A referendum on Britain's membership of the European Union cleared its first hurdle in the House of Lords today. The bill was given an unopposed second reading after a lengthy seven-hour debate in the Lords in which more than 60 peers spoke. But there were warnings from Labour and Liberal Democrat backbenchers that the legislation, which guarantees a vote on EU membership in 2017, could be delayed and fail to make it back to the House of Commons in time to become law. The backbench peers intend to table a series of amendments to the European Union bill, meaning it could run out of parliamentary time. Now, I find it astonishing that such an important question about how the people are governed can be run around the Lords and Commons like a hamster in a wheel. Perhaps a little persuasion is required. I wonder how focused they would become if every person in Britain suddenly deliberately stopped paying their council taxes. The 95 Strong Backbench Group wrote to the Prime Minister arguing that the Commons should have the authority to veto European legislation and to scrap measures that threaten British national interest. Signatories to the letter drafted by senior MP Bernard Jenkins reportedly included James Clapperson, Connor Burns, John Barron, Anne Main and former Defence Minister Sir Gerald Howarth. Another six apparently support the proposal but have not added their names, some reportedly because they are in government jobs. <laughs> well, it's nice to know that they are acting in the interests of their constituents. Fail. This is a blag. Well, in fact, it's a lie. His notion is illegal under EU law, and whilst he leads us on with the idea that the UK Parliament can selectively ignore certain legislation, it absolutely cannot. EU law is applicable in every member state by a mechanism known as direct effect, and Foreign and Commonwealth Office Document 30, 1048, a cornerstone for many of our arguments here at the unit, makes this crystal clear. And you've guessed it, I am repeating myself, but for reasons of clarity. Look. The UK Parliament has been neutered as a result of our sellout politicians giving away our rights to govern ourselves. But just like the feckless Tom, they wander around Whitehall crowing and meowing, but you and me and everyone else knows they're firing blanks. It's Twitter Tuesday. Let's take a look at what people have been highlighting in the mainstream media. Peter Simmons sent us a copy of this Week in Eco newsletter, which reads, Now the EU have gone and done it again, this time with regard to the supply of herbal tablets. It has been on the cards for a long time, and small groups have complained and petitioned and demonstrated all to no avail. So, as from March 1st, the sale of all herbal tablets will be outlawed, unless you can afford to purchase a licence to supply these herbal formulations, which costs... A hundred thousand pounds. So once again, the small companies will be squeezed out and the large pharmaceutical companies will be able to do what they like. Star Etheridge picked up on this from the Daily Mail. The reason I picked up on this is because it highlights a connection between the medium and the message. I have said before that if in 1930 Joseph Goebbels had television, the Third Reich would have dominated Europe without ever firing a shot. Our subconscious minds cannot distinguish between reality and fiction, and so ideas and cultural acceptance, within reason, can be placed to a mass audience waiting wide-eyed in front of the goggle box. Coronation Street has been running a story about a terminally ill patient with pancreatic cancer, and the storyline follows with the topic of euthanasia. Now, the long-term political aspiration for policies on this topic and is documented in the United Nations Agenda 21 document. The politicians tell us that Agenda 21 and the New World Order is scotch miss conspiracy theory. Well, let's take a look. Humanity, 
our children will have the opportunity to live good lives too. I have lived a good life. Mr. Lamb, there's no such thing as a global agenda. Hey, friend, you're absolutely wrong. Here it is. It's called Agenda 21. Agenda 21. The primary document presented in Rio de Janeiro and adopted by more than a hundred heads of state, including George Bush, which lays out in intricate detail all of the transformation that must take place in society in order for it to become sustainable as they define sustainability. At that first meeting, the United Nations Environment Program presented them with a global biodiversity assessment. <laughs> Started in 1992, with a grant from the Global Environment Facility for $3.3 million, orchestrated and coordinated by the World Resources Institute and the World Wildlife Fund and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. This is 1140 pages that explains how to implement the 16-page treaty on biodiversity. So, circumstantial the evidence may be, but these folks wandering around the halls of power seem serious enough. Links to the video are below. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon.